What is up, Shark Nation? Welcome to another episode of the Shark Pod. Today, we've got our special guest, Fabio Molay. How are you getting on? Very good. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. <laughs> You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Mark Baker's out there, locked his uh, his whole house down over there <laughs> in lockdown over in Gray- or in, uh, in Glenageary. I always say Greystones because uh, this is live from Greystone Studios usually. Um, but Mark, how are you getting on? Good, good. There's, there's worse places uh, in the world to be locked down than Glenageary. My 5K <laughs> radius isn't too bad. Yeah, you can get to the sea and everything, I'd say, can you? Almost. Yeah, yeah it. sea, hills, Cliny Hill. You know, yeah. hey, Woody's, Woody's, I have everything. Fabio, Absolutely. how are you? I'm good. I'm in Dublin 8, so it's not bad. 5K gets you pretty far, actually. It's good. There's a lot, well, there's not a lot going on, but you can go for a run. That's about it, I think, and a walk. But no, it's, it's good. It's good. And challenge, a challenge for the next six weeks ahead. I don't know when this is going out, so, uh, but let's say for the next six weeks from the day of recording, it's going yeah. to be interesting. Absolutely. Yeah, it's and essentially it's, day one, isn't it? Lockdown day yeah, one. Yeah, it's so. day one. Um, and we are, it's, it's going to be an interesting one. I feel, I don't know about you guys, I feel kind of, like I'm a little bit more ready for this one, as in, I'm not as freaked out as I was at the the first kind of national lockdown. We're kind of like, we know how this goes, type of thing. Um, so that's all good there. Uh, Fabio, you are the, the founder of uh, Functional Fitness, as well as Funky Christmas Jumpers. Um uh, like we were just talking about before we started uh, recording, uh, I would say a national movement you may have started back in 2008. I might be, am I overdoing it there? What do you think? No, I think you're not far off there. I do see, I do see what the guys at gym and coffee have done now. They've, they've done a movement of fitness and I think we did the same only for jumpers, only what they're doing is a lot healthier and a lot better. Mm-hmm. Uh, we encourage a lot of drinking, a lot of partying, but no, we really we tried to connect families, have fun. That's what we were about, having fun. And we definitely, through the early years, we spent all the profits in the Dublin nightclubs. Uh, so that was one lesson learned already where don't be spending all your money going out. Because we used to, well, I was, there was two of us then, three of us. There was another guy, Kieran, and then another guy, Don McSharry. And yeah, we used to, we used to go out like I remember Kieran one year for 40 nights in a row went out every night. He'd go out with a jumper on. He wouldn't come home with it on now, but yeah. he'd, he'd go out and it was just, I had to jump off the wagon at some stage. I couldn't keep up like, and the first Pete friends would love it. It was good. It was good fun. We learned a lot. And yeah, looking back, you even learn even more like what was, what to do, what you could have done better, but what we did right as well. So let's let's kind of rewind the clock for people. Two thousand eight. We've talked to a lot of people who came kind of came and started businesses around that time. Um, you know, for our international listeners, two thousand eight, um, Ireland is going through um, you know one of the the many crises that pop up now and then, and um, this one is more economic, and it's kind of a, a crazy time to maybe go into business. Um, where did you guys get the idea for uh, Funky Christmas Jumpers? Was it something you saw internationally? Um, and kind of, what's the kind of background of that? Well, we used to see Gay Byrne wearing one every Christmas on the Late Late Tie Show. Or, but no, it came back 2007 with some other friends who just went out with Christmas jumpers and nobody else had them on except these guys. And they had the crack, like they were just going out and having the best crack ever. And we're like, we're missing out here. We can't get jumpers. There was one place in the UK that sold them. I think they hand knitted like 200 jumpers a year and that was it. And then eBay had some terrible stuff. So we said, like, let, let's just get our own made. So we're getting them made for ourselves. And let's get a few extra made as well. And we got three jumpers made, three designs made. I, we'd no idea about marketing. I came from, like, I had a software engineer degree, but I hadn't really been coding. We worked in a family food business. Kieran was a software engineer, but we really had no marketing experience, no e-commerce experience. And we just... Yeah, or no fashion experience. I don't think much was needed. So we started off getting all these cutouts and looking for crazy graphic designers. And was we thought it was really complicated, but it turned out being really easy that we just had to get three pictures and send them to China. And that was it. Now we got we different factories and we got different samples. That's the short story. But it wasn't as hard as one would make it out to be. Probably finding the factories was hard back in the day. There was no Alibaba 
and finding designers was a bit harder back then as well. There's no 99 designs or Upwork or other things. So it, there were bigger challenges, but once you got on top, top of them, like the manufacturers worked the same system. Obviously the UPSs and DP, DHLs weren't as quick, but it was, it got the samples in. They arrived in in maybe November, 2008. And we said, Oh, how comes and we started off with, I think one of the first things we did was we put, I'm not sure, you know, the Dublin bus depot in Donnybrook. Yeah. Yeah. We put, we got these A0, the, you know, the, the president, the election campaign posters. Yeah. The ones on the, the tick plastic, on the tick curry board. We got yeah. them made and that was one of the places we, we just put one there in November. That drove sales for us. Oh, and it was just, it was just one, obviously, there was other things came. That was the start of it. And then we, we started on the radio. Like one day, uh, the late Jerry Ryan was talking about, he talking about Christmas jumpers. And my sister heard this and she rang, goes, oh, my brother's a Christmas jumper company. And that day was like, sales were like this. And that day they just stepped up and little things. And then we got a bit of press off that. And it just snowballed from that moment, actually. But we put in the hard work. We used to go to all the ATM machines on for like let's say the last Thursday last Thursday in the month we think people get paid so we used to sticker them up on Thursday night like I mean hundreds around Dublin and people you think go there take out their cash on a Friday morning and they'd be like what's this here and that was driving like you know word of mouth and sales and various things so all these things added up we were very guerrilla marketing you could say and what about social media was there any any real kind of mm-hmm. impact Did on that? That, we might have had a Facebook group back then i they've changed it over the years we had a facebook group which would have grew some traffic but there was no advertising there was no, there was none of that so i'd say year one year one and a half there wasn't much maybe a little maybe it was taking traction but we didn't have a good platform but we definitely built on that uh, it became important facebook for us we never really well i won't say in the early days we never advertised uh, where we got it wrong is we never really understood SEO back in the early days. And had we done some really good stuff with the SEOs, with the SEO work, we could have really ingrained ourselves worldwide. And we one of our competitors, well, they started off a lot later than us and they're still going there, Tipsy L's, their US company. And like in the first year sales, I think they did a million. And Jeez. they set off just SEO work in the States. And I think now they're at about, I think about 100 million in sales, oh the crazy stuff. And they sell everything now, all Halloween, all year round. But the figures, the numbers they do is absolutely phenomenal. But uh, yeah, we started doing Google AdWords in year two and three, or sorry, year three, we started doing AdWords, uh, which worked well. The early days, like I remember, like you used to get a return about eight or nine to one. So for every euro you spent, you're getting nine back, which well, yeah. they're the numbers you need to be hitting. Mm-hmm. And we started Facebook later, much later Facebook. And by then, I think it was even too late. By the time, I remember doing the maths one year, by the time we paid for the expert to do it, by the time we paid the, uh, the ad cost, the stock cost, the fulfillment cost, and all the offers we did, we were at a loss. The numbers looked, they were vanity numbers, really. If you did the maths behind it. So that was, pu- that was pulled and Google stopped working. But we had like a, we'd a press, we'd WHPR, a, a PR company here working for us, they were doing a good job. We had Heidi in there who who knew the right people to hit. We were getting the late late show every year and we weren't spending on marketing. And then Donald, one of the co-founders, was really good at, you know, trying to get it on. He had it on every uh, celeb in Dublin. Don't know, he'd always have one with him. He'd figure out where they live. He'd know half of them. We like we got onto Night Horan. We had them on One Direction on Jimmy Fallon Live. And so wow. <laughs> we hit plenty, we hit plenty of celebs. It's more than yeah, more than how would you say it? We look bigger than we were. Yeah. And it seems like you mentioned that you guys had no uh, marketing background, but it seems like you were doing an excellent job of marketing, especially in the early days with the kind of more guerrilla stuff. It's all it reminds me of, you know, uh, people who are running like uh kind of nightclub nights back when I was in college, that type of, you'd see the kind of just stickers on things or that type of thing yeah. as well. Um, that, you see that as much anymore. No, I think you get done for, you get, you get right. fine. You do. Yeah. <laughs> even right. like leaving up, 
leaving up those big boards, we put them all around Dublin. Then we put them out of the IFSC, outside certain parts. But the one in Donnybrook lasted for two years there on the pedestrian until one of our competitors pulled it off. Wow. And one of our competitors pulled it off. We heard this. And anyway, there was talk. And I can't remember what. I remember what Kieran did something to, I'm not sure. Oh, sorry. They were using uh, images on their website that were from a UK <laughs> company. So Kieran called the UK company and goes, look, these guys are using your images. So the UK company got into our competitors and said, what do you do? And blah, blah, blah. So then I got a phone call getting threatened that somebody's going to come around the house and beat me up with a hammer. <laughs> that was great. There were Christmas jumper wars back in the day. Like it was mad. I was going to say Christmas jumper wars. It, it, to me, it seems like it might be the nicest industry to be in. It's all about, like you said, having a good time, having a, yeah. a kind of a, a, you know, a Christmas cheer. But uh, so and most most of it was like we we had the store at one stage on South William Street for about four years. And that was phenomenal. Uh, Don and his dad would kit it out. And it looked for for something that wouldn't cost us much to kit out. Like we would have spent nothing on the thing like we did a good job and Heineken were sponsors. So we used to get crates of beer sent to us every week. And every Saturday night we'd have a party and we'd get like <laughs> one of the Dublin light companies, they drop in lights and we had stamps. Like we'd stamp people during the day to come back at nighttime, get a DJ in. Like, at the time we were operating, like we weren't selling booze. People bring their own and we'd have, we'd just buy a load and Heineken would have, we'd have the fridge in there. And yeah, it was really good. As I was saying, going back to what Jim and Coffee are doing with, events like running events and health stuff we were doing it just more on the boozy events <laughs> and it was it was great at the time i wouldn't do when, it now but it was great at the time when you're in the, in the midst of that fabio were you thinking look this this is great let's just keep riding the wave or were you thinking like let, how do we how do we kind of scale this up or how do we make this safer or get ahead of our competitors what was the thought process when you were right in the midst of it at one stage we got a uk pr company which bombed we didn't bring us anything another right. stage i hired an seo company in the states i think we spent about 35 grand at the time on them and a year-long plan and we we're halfway through and i just knew this was not going anywhere i had to pull the plug our our sales from the states were about 10 percent, and i thought the more i can get this up here they're great sales because they're technically vat free sales so we sell at full price we don't charge vat to the states so the sale was worth 23% more to us to the States. And that's where the volume, the growth was in the States. And that just flopped and it just came down. We did try, like we were stuck with a lot of stock one year and which lasted us a while, but we tried, we didn't have the, the real experience really to go after. Maybe we had to be on the ground over there. We never went on the ground over there, but yeah, it was, we we tried, but we did we couldn't grow it. We got to a certain stage and we just couldn't grow it anymore. Very hard to replicate something like the way you did it in Dublin or Ireland to a whole America, a whole another continent, and True. even the UK we, would be hard as well. You know. True. We did think about let's open up a shop in London and New York, mm. that sort of thing. Where we have a present, create the same vibe over mm. there, but there's a big cost involved in that, and maybe, yeah. I, we just did, I don't know uh, I, we just couldn't grow it anymore and plus we we failed on one thing with which ultimately hurt us where we were a seasonal business we couldn't grow enough to sell other products we did try Easter stuff and Paddy's Day stuff just didn't work and had we were growing three months a year disappearing for nine months and trying to grow again so there was no momentum at all even though we had all this great press momentum and eventually you get you get that for a few years and then eventually you run out of steam and after the, the kind of three month, uh, the seasonal thing, are you guys like, I know you mentioned that you're trying to do Paddy Day, Paddy Day stuff, or are you guys going back to maybe like day jobs as well afterwards? Is that the no, thing? No, straight, straight to Vegas. Straight to Vegas. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm only messing. No, we never, we never went. No, straight back to our day. Kieran, like, Kieran was a, still software engineer and he had a load of projects going on. Uh, Donald was more to his college years really and then he ended up moving to London and he sort of had a job over there and I was sort of running the ship I was probably mostly run the ship but uh, I had worked in a family business as well so family business let me disappear for a while I nice. did try and go full-time uh, 
I was on Dragon's Den in the UK. Really? So there's, a, there's, a, there's a clip that the researchers normally pull up, me doing a stupid dance. I'm surprised you didn't find it because most <laughs> people do. Uh, but I went on Dragon's Den. YouTube afterwards. Went okay. on Dragon. Sorry? I see if we can dig it up and put it on the YouTube, uh, maybe as an intro or something. We'll see. I don't <laughs> know. You know, I, I shouldn't have brought it up. I'm sorry now. But went on Dragon's Den UK, ultimately didn't get the investment. It was on TV, but we thought it would have aired more around Christmas time and got some. It was, I tried to do it more as a PR marketing thing, but I had a great offer come in. I would have taken, I'm actually glad an offer didn't come in. And we just got back here, tried to keep going. And at that stage then I was trying to figure out something else. And because I knew like this is, this just isn't going anywhere else. Out of, out of interest, what was your, what was your biggest selling uh, jumper? What was what? My best biggest, selling? Yeah. Rudolph still is. It's gone 10 years now. And Ryan, Rudolph, did Ryan Tuberty wear that on, on one of the late That's the one dates? he wore, yeah. Yeah. That's the one. Navy Funny one. Enough, this, this is never one far away. <laughs> For everyone in the audience. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. My wife has yeah. that exact one as well. So. Who has that? My wife has one. That's oh, exactly great. Exactly. Yeah, so, I think yeah. a lot of people in Ireland have them. Then the yeah. Jesus one was quite popular because there was something totally out there. And now we sell sort of a Grinch one, which goes well with the Rudolph. I think this business ultimately is just going to tick over with a load of Rudolph, just a few stable jumpers that will sell every year. And I'm happy enough to, to just do that. I don't spend much time on it anymore. And yeah. the website, is that is that built with Shopify or is uh, that of interest? The website has been built. It's Magento website. The reason... Back in, first website we built was custom made. Kieran, remember, put together some website with PayPal buttons on it and it worked. It was great. Then we moved to Big Commerce, which worked. And then we had to make a decision because we wanted a UK store, a US store, an Irish, a European store. We want to have them localized with currencies and language and various things. Shopify was just at the early days back then. And so we choose to go with Magento. And I think that's been a had Shopify been around now it would be such an easy decision because Shopify is so good it's still limited a little bit for that sort of stuff but it's really good we functional tennis I host on Shopify and I can do it I can do everything myself I don't need a developer mm. uh, every time every October I come back to funkychristmasjumpers.com even though nothing's been touched something doesn't work security yeah. patches are always needed so there's always ongoing maintenance costs and hosting costs so I would not recommend Magento to anybody. Yeah, I use Shopify. I think it's super. And all the integrations it has in the background. And I mentioned before we were, before we went live about print on demand. Did you ever think of, you know, obviously stock is going to be a big issue um, to get around that. Having the, Im- having the images there, the order comes in, it's made and it's made on demand. Essentially. Did you ever think of doing that? You mean for t-shirts more? Or we- well, you can do it with I- jumpers. You can do it with anything. You can do well, it with journal. Yeah, we've a knitted jumper with like a fancy enough patch on it. We could never, I did think of other ideas where we just bought a navy, like a load of plain navy jumpers and we get load of patches and we could stitch them here before they're shipped. That was one idea, but I have gone down on our functional tennis store. I'm playing around with Printful at the moment. We have some prints from pro photographers around the world and we have them on there, but I'm, I'm not really pushed on it at the moment. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm trying it out. And I think it's great. It's great to be able to have a full website with 100 products that you don't have any in store. But for me, the margins aren't good enough. Mm. That's, yeah. what it, that's what it comes yeah. down to. On that one as well, like, is it, was it, was it difficult then? I know you mentioned it's so hard to find, but what's it like working with uh, suppliers in China? Would you recommend that? Or maybe like what would be the steps for people if they wanted to get something made is it difficult is it kind of like a cowboy country no, <laughs> it's no you just got it obviously word of mouth if some there's always somebody who does you know you may know somebody who's done something over there and they may help you out in manufacturing but sometimes people don't want to say which is fair enough mm. but there's alibaba is good it's just about hooking up with a few different manufacturers getting samples in what you're happy with checking what the communication's like I know then they have this appro- like for small orders where you can approve it all through Alibaba. And for that stuff, it's okay. Like we've, what the, the jumpers, we've had like three manufacturers and we've had one guy since year two. Oh, really? Still, yeah. Now we didn't get any jumpers in this year with COVID and that. It just wasn't worth any risk at all. 
So there's no, but we you know, we we do like some uh, corporate work, and we use another guy, the same guy every year, and he's good. So it's about building relationships as well. You do hear people where they get first order good, second order good, third order is goes missing or they lose their money. That does happen. So you just got to be, you got to be careful. But yeah, instinct is you, you got to trust your good and instinct. And but there's they're not all bad. Yeah, interesting. They're not all bad. And um, so the after the after the. Um, the Christmas jumpers was started to go into decline, or maybe you didn't want to put the the effort in to keep it going uh, because, like I said, that the margins were getting smaller because of advertising and competition, all that type of stuff. Um, how did you start the 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 functional tennis uh, Instagram and business yeah. out of that? To give people some background, I think it was a, almost a quarter million followers on on the Instagram page, something like that. I think we're at, yeah, we're just about 280 now. Actually, Reels has kicked Eight. things off again. Uh, but we, yeah, I went probably back helping out the family business, tried a few startups, had an app called Smart Mile for takeaway restaurants that would help. Well, sorry, we have means we were selling, we weren't, we were just building it. Uh, that would s- tell where your delivery drivers are and send people messages saying, your delivery driver's here, check it out in the map. So we're building that, but my dad passed away just, as we were, we were testing it and just at a bad point and I sort of said I just been that okay. and then I was in the NDRC as well more recently we had a, a patrol app for shopping centers to to do all checkpoints and they're checking in their in their shopping center for security and for health and safety reasons but I bailed on that as well but while all this is going on I started this Instagram page I was in my 30s had injuries wanted to find out good exercises, good programs or good tennis related content that would help me. And the bookmark feature on Instagram wasn't available yet. And I also thought there's other people my age who are probably having these issues. So why don't I just start an account and share what I find? And it just started organically like that. And we just, we've grown organically now in four years. And about maybe two years ago, I said, okay, well, let's see if I can get a product out of this. And I'm from e-commerce. So let's try and get an e-commerce product. And we got back in before the jumpers. I had a software product for tennis players to manage their tennis careers. And that's another story where the developer, I had no backup of the code. And the developer, wherever you live in the States, there was a thunderstorm that blew up his machine. I didn't know. I didn't think about having a backup, my own stupidity. And yeah, I lost the code and that was it. And I'm like, I'm not going through that again. And we did have sales. They weren't massive. So I just moved on. The jumper sort of was was my pet project then from around then. So that took over. So I said with the functional tennis, well, what can I what can I sell? And well, let's do that software project in a journal format. So I went off, found the journal manufacturer in China, got some samples from a few companies, and we start selling that. And we have selling that now. We've two, we don't have enough. We're still trying to get more products. I have two pro, two journals. We have a wooden spoon that we sell, which I have here. It's probably our best seller. It's a it's a joint wooden spoon for tennis players to work on their hand eye coordination. Oh, it's, it's just made of wood. I'm not sure if you can see this light here. Yeah. But it's, it's just made of wood, and it's just working on your contact point. And yeah, we sell these all over the world. It's <laughs> amazing. Crazy. Like, yeah, sell that and a few and, other things, but this will be this in the journals is the bulk of it all. And um, so, do you have a, like a uh, like a background in tennis before, or was it just kind of like a hobby that you wanted to explore? I, I, I would have would have played as a junior. I was never the best in my age group, but always would have played and knew, knew all the guys. And then some of my friends went on to college and would have kept in the game. And some of the friends are pros, played Davis Cup. So I was always in the bed. I did do a month in Greece playing the pro tournaments myself, but yeah. it was great experience. But I realized I'm way out of the races here, but glad I did it. So yeah. I'm always in contact with, would it be in spam, like jumped in as practice partner with some of the top Irish guys in DCU the odd time because I lived nearby at the time. So I've always been around tennis. And yes, yeah, so it's a bit of a passion project that's turned into a business that I'm slowly trying to grow with products podcasts webinars and whatever else comes along the way and what what do you think really caught fire with this with because like what people are trying to get found on uh instagram or kind of anything like we've been doing youtube for uh almost a year now 
we're, we're seeing this, starting to see an uptick only recently. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so did it start slowly and then, or was there one or two I posts th- that got shared? No, and- I think maybe it started slowly and it took up a level and went again. I can't remember. I don't think there was one post. It was just, honestly, we've posted every day for four years and two months. Like we've nearly 7,000 posts there. So it's yeah. been, we flooded them. I Well, I flooded the market and we just built up good connections. We were, you know, the amount of good relationships we built up and we used them and they talked well about us and we put out some good content. We credited so many people out there with a lot of the posts that we do and we gave away a lot for free as well. And I just think it's been day in, day out, hard work to build and there's still a long way to go, which scares me a little bit. So where, where do you where do you think this will be going, or what's the kind of vision for for that, or is there anything that like uh, that you'd like to sell in that kind of space then, or do you have any other kind of inventions like the the wooden spoon? No, there's so many. I don't know yet. That's the thing. Yeah. It's gonna. They will come. I just don't know. Them. I'm working on another version of the spoon at the moment, and which just takes time to come up with. We see, obviously, we want the e-commerce business to be the big part of the business and then we build a webinar channel. So I'm trying to figure that out and see if I can build some, a subscription service with the webinars. We only started them recently and they've gone down well. And we use the podcast just for marketing, for reach, which is, you know, podcasts are hard work. They don't, just because you have a big audience on Instagram doesn't mean you're going to get huge numbers on on podcasts. So that's grown slowly, but it's grown. And then ultimately, it'd be good to have a base like our own tennis center, tennis court at some stage. That's where we'd like to be. But that comes with a lot of expenses and bills. But hopefully, that's where it's see our own coach and then maybe our own courses as well. So there's, there's a lot to be there's a lot to be done. Is there a, a similar path that's been taken by by other companies in in different sports that you were looking at any kind of prototypes that you've kind of seen before? Not really. I'm just jump and and sometimes I just take it as it comes every day which is really a bad thing but there's there's bigger plans there and it's just finding my way how to get there and just trying to get there and sometimes you get derailed sometimes you have a plan and something else comes along and you spend time on that it's only a team really one full-time me here and I have some freelancers so have an intern who's really good keen who helps me out the podcast he looks after a lot of that which has been really beneficial Obviously, we've, we've some designers, we've some uh, podcast producer, and who else? Other people that come in and help, like freelance from time to time. But ultimately, it's me doing most of it. So the next stage would be to hire somebody else to work alongside me, look after the day-to-day, because I found during COVID especially, and more so now, I'm, I'm, probably what doesn't help is my wife has gone with a baby and she went back to work. And the day she went back to work, I just feel like I've been working too much daily on the business, not in the overall picture. Yeah. So that's what that's what I struggle with since she's gone back to work in June. That I've been too much in the day to day, not not so not too much on not enough on the overall picture. So that's what I'm trying to sort out personally myself. So that, that ever happened to you, like Mark, with with your business? Is that do you? Is that happened you know, with COVID and stuff? So yeah. Prices. Yeah. Mass, but I think <laughs> I, I think it happens with every business, you know, you're firefighting and you're, you're, you're bringing in revenue and, and you're focusing on, you know, doing your job. But as a, as a, you know, uh, partner in the business, I have to be bringing in work and I have to be, I also look after like the social media side of things. We don't have the four of us. We don't have anyone doing our social media. So everybody chips in, but, um, you know, it's, it's getting the name out there, still producing all that, all that stuff that isn't necessarily you know, cash generating, you know, mm-hmm. social media, stuff like that, but it's still important and you can't actually measure it in, 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 from a revenue perspective. So yeah, I think that happens to everybody in every business store. They're kind of just doing, doing the day to day stuff. And then the bigger picture gets put to the side and then you say, all right, I'll do it at the weekend. Then all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're I have two kids, Fabio, <clears throat> I shouldn't yeah. be doing stuff at the weekends, you know, no, I should it's... be doing stuff that we, you know, as a family, but you find yourself doing that putting those type of stuff for the weekend whereas probably not a long-term uh proper plan long term yeah. it's it's a guilt trip really i know the weekend where you're like i shouldn't be doing this but i have to do it and you feel guilty and like then sometimes like does it really matter if i do this or don't it doesn't really matter like i don't think 
So yeah. you try and, and then, yeah, I just think any, as much as I love functional tennis, I think I'm cursed though, because even functional, even jumpers was very social based, but having a business that relies on your phone is actually such a killer because you just can't hide from it. And more so with social stuff on Instagram, where you sort of, you, you want to be on the, on the point, on the boil all the time, you know, seeing what's current, what, so you have to be in there a lot. And I just find it's bad mentally as well, where it just takes its toll. Yeah. You, you want to be a, a content. You still here? Yeah, yeah, sorry. I don't know if you went there, but just with social media, you want to be on it be, because you want to have your finger on the pulse and be a content creator, but you're also, a, all of a sudden you become a consumer within two seconds when something you know, flashy I, catches just, your I'm, eye. I'm just, gonna, I'm just jumping in there. I missed the last minute there. Well, after I stopped talking, it just went black. It just went, All right. So you may want to go again. I was only talking, I was talking rubbish anyway. Okay. No, I was just saying. Probably, with, probably yeah. <laughs> with Instagram, you know, you're, you want to be creating, obviously for the business, it's a huge part of the business. But at the same time, you'll catch yourself uh, going down rabbit holes anyway. I know I do, uh, yeah. whether it's on Instagram or YouTube. Um, Instagram TV doesn't help. Uh, I just got into that recently. It knows exactly what I want to see next. How do they yeah. really track me? Instagram as, TV. Yeah. No, the I, IG TV bit. Yeah. They're go- oh, look, yeah. Reels is the next thing where they're, uh, where they copied uh, TikTok a little bit. And actually, anybody, listen, if you do have Instagram using Reels, the numbers from Reels are pretty impressive. We've got all our growth from there recently. Like, we've doubled our numbers every week because of Reels. So wow. that's my clip of the day. What, so, you know, we actually haven't even looked at that, Luke. What, what exactly I, is Reels? Reels are just 15 or 30 second videos. Like TikTok, we can do certain transitions and different things and oh, okay. they encourage you to be a bit more creative with the videos. And I think Instagram has given a preference to these videos at the at the moment and pushing them out. And not every country has access to them. So Ireland does. And it means that your content showed to, show to more people. And yeah, we've seen like our follower numbers double every week. Bec- not our, our, our weekly follower stats double. And yeah, and also our weekly unfollows. A lot of people talk about follows, but not enough people talk about unfollows. Like we'd have high enough unfollows every week as well. So you're just trying to make sure you get more followers than unfollowers. It's yeah. It, how does that make you feel? Do you, do you take that personally or do you just, you know, does it, do you take that on the chin with the unfollows? Just, or is I, enough? <laughs> when, I first start, when I first started looking, I was like, what do you mean people follow us? But I unfollow people every day or accounts yeah. every day. And if it's good, it will come back around. Sometimes you only follow stuff for a while. And then you'll follow. So it, no, you can't take these things personally. Like I'm saying that because whenever there's a, a, like a, a less than, you know, four star review on our podcast or something, I'm like, why would they do like, what, what did we do wrong in that one? Or did we offend somebody or do you know <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, it, it makes me think, help. even if it doesn't annoy me, it makes me think there must've been something in there that, you know, uh, mm-hmm. I, and it's very uh, likely that I insulted somebody or something. You know, like, <laughs> we're not so right. careful. I, I've not, yeah, you just don't, you try your best and that's all you can do. But how, how do you actually get reviews for your podcast? What's your secret to getting reviews? Um, I don't know. We never really asked for them. Um, it depends. We recently, we've, um, we've kind of uh, pushed out our distribution. So now it's on like Pandora, um, uh, oh. Amazon podcast as well. So we've actually seen an, an uptick on that. Um, and Mark was a little bit ticked off of me because uh, we could have been doing this a long time ago. And then there was a uptick uh, when it comes on. And I think Mark is completely frozen there or else he's really annoyed at me. One or the other. No, he's back. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> Sorry. Whoa. <laughs> All right. I don't know We're what's just... the story. Everybody, I think everybody's using their Wi-Fi uh, because they've nowhere else to go. Yeah, could yeah. be. 100%. Well, um, so yeah, that's... Um, no, he's, I think... Fabio's actually frozen this time. We're kind of taking taking oh. turns. Oh, sorry. Um, the yeah, so like I said, the the reviews like we never really ask for them. Some people just leave them. Um, one uh, is my wife, uh, who's uh, uses a cinnamon, a cinnamon, cin- not cinnamon, uh, synonym. Uh, so it's uh, you know, I don't really no. count them either. Um, but yeah, cool. Um, so the the reason why I think this is really interesting for me, Mark, as well, because we always like I. I don't go to the office every day now, but I'm in this kind of this room all the time. This is my little office. And 
the idea has always been really uh, kind of ro- almost romantic for us doing the e-commerce life where it's just, you know, it's the creative part and then it's shipping stuff out. And uh, I don't know which one of you just sold something, but we, I heard a cash register in the background. That type oh, of thing. Was it you, Mark? Was it? Yeah. <laughs> so um, those types of things uh, for me, have always, like I've always tried to have ideas around e-commerce. I've had a few um, challenges with some Chinese uh, <laughs> merchandise that I got myself. Yeah. Back like, in the day. I'm sorry, just you talk about, I forgot to say one thing. I did have a silk pillowcase business at one stage during all that. I have that written down here. I forgot to ask you. What's, what's, the, <laughs> what's the story there? That seems like a... <laughs> That was just a ra- one. Donald's. I remember Donald, the guy in the jumpers. His wife is a sorry, uh, fiance is a great hairdresser based in London. Does all the well was based in London before COVID, but did all the celebs, all the fashion shoots. I remember she was saying, oh, like silk pillowcases are so great, like, and I was like, okay, and it sort of stuck with me. And then one year I was like, well, why don't I just start doing? I'll I'll just start doing it. And I obviously, do you same route again? You, picking a name for me is the hardest thing. So that took forever. And we got it, we called it Lulini. And I just still don't think it was a good name, it was the best I could come up with at the time. And we got usually went to manufacturers, we saw some good silk, we looked up all the properties that it was mulberry silk, has uh, certified and all sorts. And got samples in. We tried them, you actually tried them out every night, like, um, <laughs> We ordered it, build a brand, like had a photo shoot, build my own brand. Not much. It was just a plain brand we built uh, and worked well. Used 99 designs for a lot of things. And yeah, we launched a store and it looked slick because we won the Irish photographers. I can't remember which Irish photographer it was, but great photo shoot. Looked great. And yeah, we sold. I started getting into SEO a little bit then, but we used Snapchat, a couple of the Irish Snapchat accounts were really good to us and they gave us good mentions and we i think i sold most of the stock we had in and then i realized look silk pillowcases aren't for me and i managed to sell it to a lady in the u.s really so you just what was the turnaround time from turnaround was like i think 11 months 10 months 11 months it was ridiculous like um, yeah it was easy the money wasn't massive by the way but it was a if you could do that every year i'd be happy like just build a brand, build a product, like simple brand, simple product, get a few sales, get a load of reviews and try sell the business. It's, I think it could be repeated. And how do you go about selling the business? Is there like a marketplace that you can put these up on? Or? I, yeah, there's a couple of like, let's say a, a bit like estate agents for websites. There's okay. a couple where you go, but and they look, they look for a lot of information and it's quite in-depth. But I just use Shopify had released, just released a program called Exchange. So if you go to Shopify Exchange, you will see a load of websites for sale. And that sinks in because we built on Shopify. That has all your data, knows all your numbers, knows Amazing. everything. And I was like, perfect. Synced in. And yeah, we had people like, we had people come on and ask questions and everything. And you build out a good, from the questions they asked, you build out some good sales sheets and sold. Yeah. I said numbers weren't huge, but it was worth my while for the year. I'd say, it wasn't I'd say there's people who who really know the principles, including yourself, who know the principles involved and in actually creating something like that. And they're just probably, you know, pumping out all these new websites, putting them up on on this platform and Shopify to sell them on and make them, mm. making good money just well, selling businesses. They they would, especially if they use your like Printful or you find yeah. a drop shipper. Those guys, yeah, because you're not buying any stock. For me, there's always it was the cost of buying stock. We just send it around the world. You know, if somebody's buying a business, they have to send the stock and whatever else. But with the the drop shipping stuff, no, there's you just build the website, get a load of sales, load of traffic, and sell it on. It's quite a it can work well if you know what you're doing. And I'm sure you're right. There's loads of guys who've nailed it. Class. Um, yeah. The hardest really, thing is to actually get the audience. By far, that, that's that's what well, I found is the hardest thing. That's what I was gonna say to you. Like the audience is, like, so hard to get. Like it's it's just crazy. Mm. Like we see some of these Irish influencers who I know one, and the, they have the real audience. They like a tap of a button. Their followers are such an interacting audience compared to, like our whatever two hundred eighty thousand Instagram. They're great, but they're not ready to purchase all the time. Mm. But a female influencer with a good personality, their audience is actually, that's drives so much sales. It's unbelievable. So that's great. But the 
there's still a challenge though. It's if you don't have that traffic, how do you build the, the Google organic traffic if you're not paying for it? So that's a that's if you can figure that out, that's you're winning. And that's the hard part. Yeah. You're probably better off building an audience than selling to them. Do you know what I mean? Like True. Probably well, what, what you're doing with the tennis stuff. You know, you had the audience there first. Takes time though. Takes time to build that audience with yeah. less other people, effort i'm sure yeah and other people just can do it through advertising if there's enough margin in a product like ideally when you buy a product for mm. five or you're selling it for 50 or 60 euros that's they're the sort of numbers you need to be hitting to really grow quickly yeah. and there's finally there's another guy i follow love yeah. on on you called ug monk have you ever heard of him no ug monk he's an e-commerce no. store he's probably going bets into the jumpers are going actually but he just did, he started with T-shirts and he used to get them printed locally. And he was a graphic, des- he was a, some sort of designer, graphic designer, but he started doing his T-shirts. And now he does all these other products and he's launched a few products on Kickstarter, pulling in like serious money, but he's built such a good brand and just somebody to work research and looking into and seeing, listen to his talks and how he's done it from and not using advertising. You're, you're, your audience now that you that you have, um, where would you do you do you can you break them down as to geographically where they are? Is it in Ireland? Are they a lot of them in Ireland because of that's where you're kind of based, or is it kind of just global? No, it's totally global. States, South America, Europe, uh, like our sales are, I'd say for every hundred sales, there's two in Ireland. Really? So okay. So yeah. in a way, you've, so, you've you've done the opposite to the Funky Christmas yeah. Jumpers. Which is, which is good. Which I'll complain about the jumpers now. I'll complain about this. Yeah, it's, it's no, it's great. It's really good. Uh, and shipping was a pain during COVID, obviously, because we couldn't ship to so many countries. But no, it's great to be able to ship worldwide. But the price of shipping just makes it really expensive. And okay. rather than with in Ireland, we we're just mainly shipping to Ireland and the UK. They were the, let's say, seventy five percent was Ireland and the UK. So you control that. You could have local events with functional tennis because it's so dispersed, and especially if a brand wants to work with you. Let's say Adidas wants to say, let's do something. We want to do something in the UK. It doesn't work. You need to do you need to do global campaigns. Yeah, so, but that's yeah. that's where the I know the margins on the likes of Printful and stuff are, are tighter, but that the benefit of that comes with a global business is that they have distribution centers in all around America, Latvia, Spain, I think Japan now, you know, so you could say if you functional tennis had a, a t-shirt that's saying functional yeah. tennis, this sales in America, the shipping would be next to nothing because they're, they're produced and made there and, and sent. So um, that's no, what I like about that. I, I, I completely, I completely see the benefits of that. And there's another company called the night sky. Do you ever hear them guys? No, no, actually, they're, an no. Irish, they're an Irish company, probably, I'd say one of the most successful Irish companies, e-commerce companies out I there. I have actually. And they do the what the stars were like in a certain night and get it printed out. But they have yeah. print, they do, they did deals with printers all over the world and they ship locally. But they're based in Ireland. Small team actually use Facebook a lot, but they actually killed it. And they're, yeah, they maybe still that's killed very it. Clever. Yeah. But those guys, so yeah, I do agree. If you can find the right product that you can get local distribution partners, you're winning there. Yeah, yeah. Make, I think, me, make me think here, Fabio. I'm going to leave my job and come up with this, the next silk pillow. Um, nice. uh, you, I'm you surprised you didn't advice. buy any of them, Luke. I know Luke sleeps in uh, silk sheets there in Greystones. Yeah. Nice. Uh, that's what they do in Greystones, is it? That's, well, how, they, that's how the, yeah, some people live here. Um, that's, I'm actually, my skin's, that's why my skin's so good, the silk pillowcases. Exactly. <laughs> it's working uh, like a charm out there and Dublin 8 and Mark Baker so uh, this is where Mark and I chimes in with the lightning round or the, the quick fire answer or quick fire question rather it doesn't have to be a quick fire answer but it's we found this really interesting because it just allows us to uh, kind of contrast and compare the people that we have on uh, you'd be surprised at how different some of the answers can be yeah. um, but there is kind of a theme that goes through them with all of the, the people so Mark Baker what's 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 been on your mind uh, for Fabio? <laughs> okay, nice and easy at the start. What apps do you use the most on your phone? Instagram. By Instagram, InShot for video. Best video app in the world. It's so I good. Have, yeah. not, not, 
uh, repost repost videos. They're the top. They're the top three now. I'd use unbelievable. In shots, are you guys on Twitter? We are. <laughs> fun, we've. Well, sorry, we've two accounts on Instagram actually, but one uh, funk tennis. We're not. We're not killing it on Instagram, unfortunately. No, I don't think it, it lends well to that to that type of uh, business. In, uh, uh, Twitter. You can no. It, Twitter can lend well to if you're an expert in the area. You think so. Yeah, I think so, but I'm not an expert really in the tennis deep down. I'm not a journalist or tennis expert or tennis coach, so that's yeah. why it hasn't worked for me. And plus, it comes down to bandwidth as well up here. I don't have time to. Be, I'm on Instagram enough. I can't be spending time on. You could spend yeah. your day on TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram, and you'd be going to bed and doing it again tomorrow. There's, there's work. And to just be for 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 scheduling posts, do you use Buffer or Hootsuite or anything like that? Don't schedule. Uh, really no there was one point where I went on holidays and I had to use an app back in the day I can't remember it wasn't Buffer it was some other app it was called I actually can't remember what it was called but it was a few years ago but since then I've been posting myself I do the odd time use Facebook Creator Studio to post stuff uh, so you're not paying you don't have to pay for Buffer or any, you, don't, you can just do it all through Facebook Studio or Creator Studio which has got better much better lately but yeah. in general I'm more on the we have some weekly post teams that we go with and then i'm a bit more on the fly with a lot of stuff a lot of opportunities pop up and to to make the most impact to be first to post and all things uh that's why we have a lot of room for posting on the go what has the biggest impact is it is it images or is it video a video kills it but look video kit roger federer video kills it like roger federer practice video kills it uh but Different things, it changes all the time. Like images have done better lately than they had been doing. Now, carousel videos with like training videos, like gym workouts broken down, they're killing it at the moment. And you track them differently. Like now you track, I'm tracking with bookmarks. Like someone's getting a thousand, two thousand bookmarks. It's pretty crazy. Like you may not see the numbers in loves or likes, or but you'll see all these crazy bookmarks. So that's people find it valuable if they're bookmarking content and Absolutely. sharing it. Absolutely. Okay. Um, what's the best business idea you've never acted upon? It seems like you've acted on every everyone that's popped into your mind. It seems, but uh, nah. is there a few that got, got away? There are a few. Nah. I still want to open up a pizzeria. <laughs> it hasn't got away yet. It still may happen someday. I just come from a food background. I think it's interesting area. I like it. Obviously, just because you like something, it's not a good idea to open a business about it. But I think I could make it work and like combine all the work I did with the jumpers and my uh, family McCarry's business, the takeaway business and combine them and make it work. But I won't be doing that anytime soon, but I think it would have been, be a good business. And I did think of an app called Facebook, but I didn't do it. <laughs> but uh, okay. yeah. I think the people idea, that's my dream as well. Imagine having, but, but that's what you're saying, though. It doesn't mean I can just eat pizza all the time. That's not yeah, the, no, that's the def- game. No, <laughs> food, business is re- food business is really, really hard. Don't get me wrong. I know what it's like. Yeah. It's really hard. But it's my, as I said, my background was meeting people face to face over a customer, over a, over a counter. And we brought that to, fu- to Funky Christmas Jumpers where we were personal with everybody. Customer service was unbelievable. So that I learned a lot from that. And I think I can then bring it back there, hopefully at some stage. Nice. Okay. What time do you get up at in the morning and what time do you go to sleep? God, late, lately I've read a lot of, uh, well, about two years I read the Matthew Walker book. Uh, is it called Why How I S- Why We Sleep? Unbelievable. It was really, I'm sort of into that stuff a little bit. And got that, got myself an aura ring, uh, which oh. I've been wearing now for about, since they released a new version, a year and a half, which is great. So I got more into the sleep and probably get up between half five and half six and i try and be in bed at half nine wow so that, <laughs> now, but we do have a baby so my wife is unbelievable there during the night but you're obviously woken up most nights and now he's sleep he's about he's 14 months now so he's now he's finally sleeping some nights through the night which is amazing so yeah. the sleep's been broken so you may spend a lot of time in bed because you're up for a while and but you yeah, listen, you're listening I, carefully to that luke yeah, sleep, I, is, I, sleep is important. 
Yeah, the whole, uh, the, I'm not sure if you're into sleep tracking. I think it's, I don't look at it every day. I might look at it every month and just see the month stats. And like I went to Australia last year for the uh, Aussie Open and it took me a month for my sleep to get back to normal after that. Like you could visibly see it and different things. It's pretty, it's interesting. You won't want to look at it every day, but it's, if you're into it. See, because I like all the stats and stuff like that, I thought this would be great. So I had, um, had something to do that. Um, but then I actually, it was putting me off sleep because I'd, I'd be looking at it and go, oh, geez, I haven't been, I've only got an hour and 20. Uh, I better try harder. <laughs> and then that doesn't help. Like, no. or I wake, and sometimes I'd wake up and go, oh, I've only got five and a half hours of like this good sleep. And then it would put me off for the day because I'm like, ah, this is a bit of a write off. I don't want to try today. <laughs> it's don't not look, gonna... that's, that's why you just don't look at it. Look at it every month, see the monthly yeah, trends and don't get. Good. There's some stuff you some stuff you can't control. I think some of it you can't. And I've shit REM sleep, and I just can't get it up. And you you could try the thing where you wear the blue light, the, the blue glass at nighttime, or put your iPhone on red mode, or don't use a laptop for two hours before bed. I've tried all that; it doesn't change anything. And yeah, so next is next thing I'll try will be one of those what they call the the thing that people with diabetes use. The blood, the constant blood sugar monitor. That's what you should get next. Track your <laughs> blood sugar. That's a whole other. Anyway, note. I'm probably freaking you're, people. You're listening, you're, you're listening to a too too much Tim Ferriss, I think, uh, Fabio. Yeah, no, I no, I wouldn't say that now, but into that stuff. <laughs> um, okay. What do you think we're pushing it here? Two two burning questions that you've got there, and then we'll mm. let Fabio go back to his family. Okay. How much money is enough money? How much money is enough money? Oh, sorry. Are we there? Yeah, you're there. there. I ran there. I ran. Uh, <laughs> is, is this how much money to just quit, go live on it in a desert island? Yeah. Or how much money were you? You can like, interpret oh, it whatever way you in want. In the bank. In the bank. Cash in the bank. So you never worry. So you never worry. God, I, I, I've actually never really thought of that. Uh, you need the millions anyway. You need quite a few. I'm not going to say 100 million because we got to be realistic a l- little bit. But I'd say so diminishing it, returns after a certain amount. You know, I I'd say like by the time you buy buy yourself a nice house here, a couple of nice cars, a holiday home, like you need 10, 15 million. Let's be honest. No, at least I like where your heads at, Fabio. Some people. Yeah, I I, I, I don't want to say. I don't want to say. At least it's a bit more realistic than say, right now than saying a hundred million or two hundred million or a billion. I, so. We asked somebody before, and they said with without any gap, they just go twelve million, and they broke down exactly what they would need that for, and we're like, okay, fair enough. Uh, well, they've thought about it. Look, that's planned. Goal setting. Goal yeah. setting. Most most people, Fabio, say kind of to cover your, the high, the hierarchy of needs. You know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which mm-hmm. is you know, food, shelter. But it, stop right there on shelter. Shelter in Dublin, you know, a lot, costs of, a lot of money. Yeah, like you know? no, I agree. But one thing we don't talk about is health. Like that's probably mm. way more important than all that stuff. We can talk about money's great, and money does help problems. It does create problems, but it does make your life easier. Even if you if you've health problems, money can make your life a lot easier. I've seen yeah, yeah. it get to better health, better support, and you know your, your family don't have to be working if i've seen this play out so money is an advantage but obviously your health is number one and so it's health plus 10 or 15 million that's all that's all we're asking <laughs> yeah, <right? nah. laughs> not too much left, Mark. Last one. Nah. <laughs> okay um all right two, just two more right the, the second yeah. the second last i'm one. no rush here no is it is it is it who you know or is it what you know that's a tough one that's a tough one so you don't you learn stuff from people ultimately being around people. So who you know is important. Now I actually can't, I don't answer that. Do I have to answer it? I think they're both important. That's an Uh, answer. Yeah. Some people, some people say that. Yeah. I think they're both important. And who, you know, I can help you more than what you know. Okay. Um, Does that make sense? No. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. But I it doesn't agree. mean who you know is more important. It doesn't mean that. <laughs> okay. So, it, okay. Now I get it. Safe, I like it. You're safe on, on the fence there. You can stay there. Yeah. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> okay. If, if you could advise somebody to learn one skill, what would it be? 
what I'd love to have learned more scale, I think really great scale, is languages. Be able to speak okay. a load of languages, French, German, Italian, Chinese, speak them all. Like I think it's just re- it's, because you, you align yourself so many cultures then and you can interact with so many people. And I think it's a really powerful thing if you can have conversations in different languages. It's such a powerful really thing. Powerful. Yeah, like, I, I think I've loads of people like that. And it's, I can't, like, so one, one girl in particular, she's from Finland and she has five languages and she walked around the office, talking to everybody. She can go see their cinema. She's like, she's having like a richer life experience just because <laughs> she's getting all these, uh, it's not just the one. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry oh, go I'm sorry. For, no, <laughs> I no, I wasn't was, saying anything. Like, um, no, I just, I think it's a, it's a really good one. And I, I'm going to try to put that on us. Luke. Luke, you learned in your later years, learned Irish. Um, so Start that's opened good. up. Yeah, I was born in Canada, so I never did Irish at school. And then oh. uh, my wife is a Goyal school teacher. So we, uh, I started learning when I was about 30. I had a, like, I'm still learning. I've like, really got back into it in the last week or so. But um, like, it's been so, so interesting. And there's no, like, a lot of the people in the classes I was taking had bad experience in school or, you know, I had no baggage mm-hmm. at all. I was just having fun and we went up to the Goyle talk for a week, uh, like like the adults version of that. And mm. it was, uh, it was amazing. It was like being a teenager again. There was like 50 adults there. We we're in the pub all the time. There was like music on everyone speaking Irish. It was, it was fabulous. Mark well, thinks it's- <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I don't know what to say. Fair play to you. And I think there's another podcast episode where you can talk about why the Irish system doesn't work in this country, but uh, I'm not the man to get into that. So, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's, it's such a waste of resources and kids' time where you, you spend, what is it, from your five until you're, till you're 18, learn a language and you get nothing from it whatsoever. I think it's just a waste of time. And anyway, that's another day. Yeah. And the, yeah, it's just, it's, yeah, again, you could go, you could go into the, into the layers there. I, um, I think travel, getting back to the language question, travel's important would be closely to that because Obviously, if you can travel or spend summers away, if you're lucky enough to do these things or after college to spend time traveling, something I didn't do enough and I did more recently and I wish I'd done a lot more of it. And what, what's the what's the language you would pick if you uh, if you were, to just the last question, we promise. What's the, the, the language that you would love to speak or the culture that you'd love to kind of get more involved in? Right, uh, I don't, I like French for some reason. I can speak a little bit of French. I'm not that bad, but to be fully immersed in it, like I speak Italian, I would have grown up with Italian. And I think French, German would be, them two would be Spanish, not another, but like they're all great. Like I'd love to have them all. Yeah. I think Spanish might be my next one. It's just such a big world. You know, there's so much going on. You speak to some people. But uh, my 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 eight year old, sorry. My oh, eight-year-old is learning uh, Japanese uh, nice. uh, through the Duolingo app. Yes, you know how's that going? Good. Yeah, she can. She can. I don't know if she, if it's right or not, but it sounds it sounds like it's real Japanese anyway to me. <laughs> oh wow, that's great. That's, yeah, I actually have been thinking that recently on my morning run. I was like, why don't I just get a one of those apps and give that a go? I've never done it, so uh, sometimes you think of ideas at certain time during the day and then you don't think about it till the next day till you're doing the same thing so it's one of those ideas but now i did so i may try and get on it tonight it's kind of a new year's resolution type thing isn't it that you, you know you have to kind of stick to for the year yeah what so fabio would you prefer a t-shirt or a mug that's kind of the that's the the bombshell we end on usually so t-shirt that looks like this that's or a mug good. a coffee what's what's your what would be your preference is it from principle it may um, not be from. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm, kidding, I'm joking. <laughs> I've hand made it. I hand painted Fabio. Nice. A hand painted mug. That sounds pretty cool. That sounds cool. God, <laughs> guys are making me make tough decisions tonight. Yeah. All the, uh, I, I don't I Look, I'll go for the, I'll go for the mug. Absolutely. So uh, we'll get that out to you as soon as possible. Uh, Fabio Mole, thank you so much for joining us on the Shark Pod tonight. It's been so thank interesting. You. Love to learn about the uh, the e-commerce business, the Instagram stuff, the funky Christmas jumpers, the silk uh, silk yeah. pillowcases. It's been a it's been a wild journey. So uh, thanks very much, and uh, hopefully we'll be back soon.
Thanks, Thanks for having me on, guys. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Uh-huh.